Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. It's been a hot minute, right, since you've seen me. Sometimes I just don't really like to be on camera. So, all right, we've been following the Lori Vallow Chad Daybell cases, right? Most of us. And then we started following the Gabby Petito Brian Laundrie case, and people were looking for Brian Laundrie. We're still following that. So I thought as a palate cleanser, I would watch an HBO documentary. I love documentaries. I like to review the documentaries. So I saw one called The Way Down, and that's what this is about. The Way Down, God, Greed, and the Cult of Gwen Shamblin. If you haven't watched this documentary, this is going to be a full spoiler doc documentary review. So stop right now, go watch it, and then come back. And it's like we're going to be sitting around the water cooler having a talk, right? Because this thing, it's a whole mess. It's a whole, whole, whole entire mess. To start, let me give my caveat that this video is my opinion only based on the information presented in the HBO documentary called The Way Down. Also, I have a family member that had some knowledge about their experience with the church, so that's where my opinion is being formed. Opinions aren't facts, and the viewers are always encouraged to watch the documentary, in order to form their own opinions and also the people and the entities like the church that's mentioned herein, they're not guilty until proven guilty in a court of law. They're considered innocent. So again, anything that I say is my opinion. So without further ado, let's get into this absolute mess. We travel to Brentwood, Tennessee. Previously, it was a crossroads city between Nashville, Tennessee and Franklin, Tennessee. And I have relatives in many of these places. So you knew what I was doing after I watched this. I was like, ding, ding, ding. Yeah. It's a wealthy bucolic enclave of Southern families populated with churches and more churches. And it's in the Bible Belt. It's a suburb of Nashville. And Brentwood is one of the wealthiest cities in Tennessee. It has a population, I think, right now of about 42,000 people. And at that time, 2,000 of these folks were members of this church, okay? So that's a, that's a large chunk. If you're not sure what to think while you're watching the documentary, you know how sometimes you don't know if something's campy or if something's a joke, you know, campy, or if it's serious or if it's sad, the music underlying it lets you know, right? The oboes and the womp, 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 womp. Yeah, this is, this is campy. In some parts, the documentary is giving you a soundtrack that is goofy. So enter Gwen Henley. She will marry as Shamblin, so she'll be known as Gwen Shamblin, born into a conservative Church of Christ family on February 5th, 18th, 1955. And in my understanding, that sect is into restorationism. Now this is just my loose understanding of it. So I don't mean to offend anybody if you're Church of Christ. Restorationism, I believe, let me give you the definition of it. It seeks to correct the faults or deficiencies in the church by appealing to the primitive church as a model, hearkening sometimes back to the Old Testament. And if you don't know anything about Christianity, you have the Old Testament and a lot of the Judeo beliefs are in the Old Testament. And then you have the coming of Jesus and then you have the New Testament, which is a lot more forgiving and a lot more loose with the rules. But in my opinion, almost all the churches have a basic goal, and that is to convert people to the church. Not only to ver convert people into believing in Jesus or believing in God, but to convert people to that church. All right? That's my opinion. Gwen Henley, she attends the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, in 1974. And she studies, I think they called it diet, dietics, diet, essentially nutrition, all right? And then she receives her master's degree in food and nutrition from Memphis State University. And she even works there as a faculty member. And in my opinion, this is the way I look at it, Gwen gains the freshman 15. You know when some folks, they go off to college and they're at a dorm or whatever the story is, they're away from their parents' way of eating and they're, they're studying a lot and they gain weight. You know, actually that's a time that some women just naturally start gaining weight to prepare for having babies. So she gains the freshman 15 and what does she want to do? She wants to lose the weight. And what does she do? She comes up with something that's rather novel is combining 
Christian beliefs, you know, the, the, the idea of God and then weight loss, and she ties it together. So you've got like Richard Simmons and Dee Meal and all those little things. Well, she made something called the Way Down Workshop. And it's the concept of honoring God with your body, which on its face is not a really, it seems innocuous enough. It seems innocent enough. Like your body's a temple. That's some of the scripture that talks about how your body's a temple. But she gives tips like wait until your stomach growls before you know you eat. That's kind of like intuitive eating and portion control, okay? So people use that as weight loss. I mean, to me, if you, if you just wanna talk about weight loss and not talk about this documentary, there's a scientific formula for weight loss that's, it, it, it applies all the way across the board. Calories in, calories out. You wanna have less calories in than you have calories out. That's how you lose weight. I think it was a clever idea to mix God and weight loss in an overweight society in which a lot of people believe in Christianity. It was, it, it was an awful idea. She saw the hole in the market and she went, plugged it. And if you've ever been in, say a Southern church, they love them some workshops. They do, they love to meet and get, buy the little books at the bookstore or wherever and come with their little workbooks and meet and talk and, and encourage each other. I mean, in a way, you know, I don't know about Jenny Craig, I never had issues that way, but don't they kind of have like where they have a, a mentorship and, a, and um, feedback and accountability? So think about that. That in itself is not such a dang bad idea. But what people didn't realize necessarily was that there really wasn't anything new under the sun in these workbooks, the intuitive eating, the portion control, that's not new. And they could find that elsewhere, but she had slogans that she created like, don't bow down to the refrigerator, bow down to him, meaning God. Like, put God first. Anytime you're putting food over God, that's disobedient and eating and seemingly sinful. And also, honor God with your body. Again, that, that aligns with biblical teachings of keeping your body as a temple. Like, don't put unclean things in it and don't you know, harm yourself. Love yourself, like, love God. So, treat your body as a temple what happens with the, the member seemingly would lose some weight because you've got portion control, you've got eating when your stomach's growling and not eating when your not, stomach's not growling. You've got people around keeping you accountable. And then you've even got a little bit of shame if you don't follow the rules, right? So people did lose weight and they're getting up and they're giving these testimonials. So they, this is also one of those churches where it just seems like they just love to film everything and they love to have stuff on audio and things on video. So you have all these testimonials that have been recorded of people talking about how they lost like a hundred pounds. I mean, it's like not just, oh, I lost five pounds. It's like 150, 180. Like they lost a lot of darn weight. And, it, and I guess, you know, that state does have a lot, you know, has a high rate of obesity and it did then too. She cornered a niche in this market but she herself was stick thin. And I know we're not supposed to talk about people's looks, but I'm not doing this to make fun of her. I am doing this to say objectively how somebody looks. And to me, she objectively looked almost anorexic. Okay, all right, I'm not saying that because I'm not a doctor, right? I'm not. But if you're only eating when your stomach is growling and you call that growl God's hunger point that's going to and that's what you're espousing that's going to harm some people people like me I need to eat three times a day I can't wait until my stomach growls otherwise I'll pass out I can't rely on that and that's not safe for everybody there's no one size fits all except for it's a formula calories in have to be less than calories out calories out could be burning it off with exercise or it could be just taking in less calories but that is how you lose weight that's honestly how you lose weight she had all these tips and i'm going to give a trigger warning if you're sensitive to talk about eds this may be not the a documentary for you to watch because they dance around it but eds are an issue here in this church in my opinion because they give tips that many people in the ed culture talk about like you take a bite and then you drink a bunch of water then you take a bite and you drink a bunch of water. What happens is your stomach is gonna fill up. 
and you're gonna feel full and you maybe didn't take in enough calories, which is gonna make you lose weight. But if you do that over and over and over, it's gonna make you sick, just my opinion. So people paid to take the Way Down workshop and allegedly it wasn't cheap. So at the height of the success of all the workshops, being kind of, out, I wouldn't say outsourced, but where you had the workbook, you could have other people teaching it. So it was being taught all around, all around. And approximately during the, big, the biggest success years between, I think it's 95 and 98, 250,000 people attended these workshops in, in their churches and they bought her books. So she also then spawned a books, you know, first, I believe, dealing with the way down diet and then other books. Yes. Yeah, so, and she even, she was published by Doubleday, which is a reputable publisher. And the book sold in a, in a good amount. I believe that some of her books sold in the amount of 400,000 books. That's a lot of money that you're bringing in. And in my opinion, this is where the cult, I'm going to say the C word, the cult of personality has been formed. Now, granted, critics charge that this, this, this church that it turns into becomes a cult. That's their opinion. If anything, I think it's a cult of personality where you have one person at the top and everybody deans down to what that one person is. If, it, if they claim they're an intercessor to God, so be it. But Gwen Shamblin, she was married at this point in 1999, she jumps off into the founding of this thing called the Remnant Fellowship Church. Okay, so she, it's in Franklin, Tennessee, and she breaks off. And it starts with an inner circle of about seven founding members. And undoubtedly, Gwen Shamblin, then later called Gwen Shamblin Laura, because she marries again, we'll get into that. She's a charismatic person. She's one of those charismatics. One of those people that is bright, shiny, happy, skinny. When she first started off, she looked like a middle-class American, blonde hair, blue dye, blue eye, looked like she was had things going, you know, and she sucked folks in. These remnants, this church, it was called the remnants because remnants are leftovers. And they hearken back to that old chestnut in the Bible about the 144,000. And if you're watching this and you follow the Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell case, and if you also downed out the Mormons because of Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell's belief about the 144,000, here's an example of the Christians doing it. They're not Mormons, but they did it too. So that that language in Revelations about the 144,000 people that would be left on earth, that's a remnant community, the Church of the Firstborn is what they called it in that Vallow Daybell mess. Here they're calling it a remnant. But they believe they're special. It's an elitist group, okay? And they're the righteous remnant of only obedient survivors who are left, you know, in the end times. And they're the ones that have the way to the promised land. You know, that Bible, that section of the Bible has caused so much difficulty in this world. I just want to say it. It is so damaging. Okay? True or not, I don't know. But that language in the Revelations has caused so much freaking trouble in Christianity, in Mormonism, in Catholicism, in evangelical beliefs. I am not fond of that, by the way. Sorry to get off my rant. So, this 144,000, they're the way to the promised land. It's an elitist theory of only that group that they were going to survive the end times. The, and many groups, many cults use that exact same language, that exact same chapter and verse to justify their wackadoo beliefs and their crazy elitism, in my opinion. August 10th, 2000, she's created this remnant group, okay? And she sends an email out, allegedly, to her followers saying that she believed the doctrine of the Holy Trinity was not biblical. Yeah. Now, if, if, you don't, if you're not a Christian, you're going to be like, okay, yeah, so, no, no, no. Okay, so you have a foundational belief. And it's that you have God as the Father. And this is, again, this is feelings, bootleg, Christianity, you know. Take it for what it's worth. But you have God the Father, who had the Son put on earth 
born after all the father's traits in order for God to realize what it was like to be on earth. So you have God the Father, you have Son, and then you have the Holy Ghost, which I've always viewed it as like your conscience. It, he's indwelling in the, in the human spirit in order to make all this work. So God is up in the heavens, you know what I mean? He's up infinite being, and then you have the Son that came, Jesus, to restore humans back to, to God because we were so sinful and screwed things up so bad that by him, his sacrifice was the only way that made it so that we could right ourselves is believing in him. Okay. And then he's resurrected from the dead. And then you have the Holy ghost. That's always indwelling in people to help them get back. And it's called a Holy Trinity. And it is, and also you learn the most stable structure in the world and in the universe. So at least on the earth, is the triangle okay so if you want to get into it i'm not getting into the illuminati because i know a lot about occult stuff but the triangle triangle is very important and you don't you don't mess with the triangle and you don't mess with the foundations of christianity if you're going to claim you're a christian now if you want to claim you're something else that's fine but if you're going to claim you're a christian you don't go messing with the holy trinity but she did she said it wasn't big biblical and she appeared to disavow the holy trinity which is a staple of Christianity so she loses half of her followers with this all right but you got to think anytime you do something like that and you lose half you shake the dust from your shoes right and you've got a steady group that now they're behind you if they're willing to, to like toss off the Holy Trinity they're with you for the long run right so it's 2002 and Gwen Shamblin's shambling along right she's got this way down workshop stuff coming. She's got book, you know, money coming in. She's got this church that's flourishing. She lives with her family in Ashlawn. Allegedly, it was a huge historic mansion in Brentwood. And she has upwards of 2,000 members of the, in the church with her. And outwardly, outwardly to people, they are shiny, happy people. And I think of that REM song, Shiny Happy People Holding Hands, because they really just plastered the smile on, didn't talk negative, didn't talk about any kind of mental illness. They were shiny, happy, stepperty, everything's lovely, we, you, we love it here, you're going to love it here, come join our church. So, so the former members who are interviewed in the documentary, they liken the behavior to the Stepford wives and the kids wearing like turn of the century, like Victorian clothing with like ringlets and stuff. Now granted, I don't think that lasted for very long, but that's what they said. And then the members begin to ape the looks of their leader, Gwen, like you do, like you do, right? In a C word, you start aping them. You want to be just like them. And this is where it gets campy. And again, I don't like to talk about people's looks because my looks aren't perfect. You know, nobody's are, you know, but when you pick on people in your membership and you kick them out allegedly for get, gaining weight, and you pick on them because they might be depressed, then I'm gonna pick on you for how you look. And let me tell you, she looks like she's dancing with Anna, if you know what I mean. This woman is too darn thin just, just by looking at her, all right? Maybe she was healthy as a horse. But also her hair, she starts off as just like a soccer mom. Like she, she could be at a PTA meeting, she could be in the homeowners association with the normal like newscaster type hair and the suits you know going on larry king live but then as time evolves and the ego gets bigger the hair's getting teased up and it's like going up i swear to god you guys as you watch it as the years tick by the hair gets higher and higher and it reminds me of that old saying like i don't know if it's this texas saying but it's like the higher the hair the higher to god because tennessee's really not big on well, you have Dolly, which Dolly's like, I love Dolly. She's a, a thing unto herself, but most folks aren't like that. That's more like a Texas thing, but oh yeah, yeah. Hire the hair, hire to God. She reminds me of like she was trying to steal Tammy Faye Baker's swagger and fails ab abysmally. Her, also, her skirts get higher and higher and higher as the years go by. Now, granted, I'm 50 years old and I'm even like, mm, you know, not wanting to go too high above my knee. You know what I mean? Just, just for aesthetics, you know? But this woman, and then she starts wearing these stacked heels, like, and, I mean, the heels are tacky. I mean, not, I guess not if I was walking the street, but I, you know, for a church leader, it just is like, ma'am, ma'am, put, put some clothes on, <laughs> put some clothes 
on, ma'am. Okay, so I'm going to stop being snarky. Let, let's move on. But I want to say one more thing. The music in, at the church, in my opinion, is just ugh, horrible. And I say this, I don't mean the documentary music that, that's, you know, behind the people talking and stuff. I'm talking about the music that they produced at the church. And bless their hearts, you know, it's not your fault. You, ha you had a, a leader that liked a certain thing, and then the leader's son was doing the music. And I get it. You know, I honestly get it. But the music was cheesy AF and tacky AF. And that's just my opinion. But Gwen had been married. She'd married. She had two kids. And her husband is David Shamblin. Bless your heart, David, if you ever watch this, No Shade Against You. He was married to her for decades. And they had two children. One was Michael. That's the firstborn son. And the second is a girl named Elizabeth. And the husband, David, through these decades that, you know, she's doing the Way Down workshop and she's doing these books and she's getting more of a group and they're, they've got a remnant that they start up. He basically stops going to church allegedly because he's overweight and not into it okay so the fruits of your labor have to be come correct right and she was allegedly very critical of people who gained weight and allegedly they claim that she shunned them like they would be shunned from the church for gaining weight so what are you going to bring your husband who's fluffy to church no so i mean it, to me the the hypocrisy is why i'm pointing this out Honestly, I got plenty of people around me who are chunky and fluffy and they don't care and I don't care. It, that's not the point. The point is if you're picking on people for gaining weight, then you you need to look at your own house. You know what I mean? And, and realize. So he wasn't a perfect um, example of her teachings. He was not bearing the proper fruit. And, you know, because that's part of a brand. It's part of a brand. And allegedly, he didn't want to ever divorce his wife. He loved his he loved his wife, and the members talk about how they were were I don't want to say butthurt, but they were upset by the hypocrisy because throughout the years, the members would have just naturally you have a big church, you have two thousand people, you're gonna have some folks that have domestic violence in the house, they have abuse in the house, they have cheating in the house, and all kinds of stuff, and they want to get divorced from their spouse, and they allege, they many have come on this documentary and allege that she would not allow them to divorce. Or, and or, if they proceeded with the divorce, the, the non-divorcing spouse, the one that stayed with Remnant, would get the full backing of the legal team of Remnant behind them. Well, that's going to make you not want to leave, right? So now, now you're seeing that there's there's a problem here. Houston, there's a problem. She's staying married to her husband and telling other people to stay married, all right? And then when she up and divorces her husband for this other guy, this younger, not that much younger, but this younger, studly guy that fits the image, people get right, rightly butthurt about it. You know, they're bitter they're angry they're resentful of the hypocrisy that she's now displaying you know it's henry the eighth 2.0 it's like no you know the church says you shall not do this but then the minute amboy Boleyn comes along he's like up oh, you know what let's find a way around this well that's the same thing and she did it she divorced her husband and she take you know she takes up with this other guy and so people were irritated about that as well so she divorces her husband david in 2018 and allegedly, she paid him a lot of money to get divorced. Yeah, I think actually, I don't even think HBO told the public how much. Allegedly, it was a lot of money. Like, maybe like $3 million cash. That, like, everything on the cash front that they had in the, in the accounts. And more in order to get the divorce. So, he at least got, got set up to some degree. But I just want to lay the groundwork for the hypocrisy that's starting to be very obvious to the members and that some of the members also felt trapped, perhaps. That's what's coming out in this documentary. Then there's a lawsuit. And this, this is interesting as hell because you have the Way Down Workshop, right? And I guess it was going on in so many different places because, you know, you could do it if you had the workbook and I'm sure there was some training and all this stuff. But anyway, she had the Way Down Workshop and she had employees that did not, that she hired that weren't part of the church. And then these five different people allege that they were told to become, well, that they were forced or 
urge to become a member of the church in order to keep their employment. And you got to know that's against that's against the law. That is you have a right to freedom of religion. And so what happens is, you know, it's illegal as a condition of your employment to require your employee to attend a certain church. And, you know, that's against your freedom of religion. So what happens is these five different people end up finding the same attorney. And so they all joined their their case, came against, I guess, her and the church or her and or the church. I, I didn't check that element of it, but they got a settlement, which obviously if what they had alleged had some truth to it, that was a good outcome. However, if you know anything about trials, if you settle before the after the discovery process, what happens is you're going to have depositions. And so what this documentary shows is all these depositions that Gwen went under. And in depositions, you can be a fishing expedition. They can ask you all kinds of stuff. And you know what, Gwen? She has got some, you know, underneath her skirt, that skirt that kept getting higher and higher and higher. She's got some big brass ones or did have some big brass ones under there because some of the stuff that came out in the deposition made my eyes go whoa like a cartoon character because here's some of the stuff that came out in the discovery process by the way hint if you ever get sued and, and you know that you've done something wrong or someone has a mouth they cannot shut in a deposition settle before before that because oh my gosh they show one part of her crazy statements okay there was an allegation that she used the Holocaust. That was the allegation. So she's asked about this in a deposition and you see her answering it. Quote, this is what Gwen said. When people were in the prison camps and ate less food, they lost weight. All of them. What? You're, you're using this as, as a tool to get folks to lose weight? And so the attorney, and I'm going to paraphrase, that's, that's, you know, asking her questions in this deposition is like, he was aghast and he, he's like, surely ma'am, you're not comparing the forced starvation of a population to average, the amount, average American diet. And, you know, normally, and she sits there and thinks, she thinks. And you know what she does? She doubles down. She doubles down. She's like, yep, that's what I've been saying this whole time. Or it's paraphrased. Oh my God, like this woman, has she no compassion? Has she no knowledge about how offensive that is? Yeah, people in at Dachau and Auschwitz lost weight because they were living on 300 cal, you know, calorie diets at the most and were being forced to work the whole day long. Yeah, you're gonna lose weight then. Is, is, that, your, is that what you're going for here, lady? You don't bring up the Holocaust, you just don't, but she did. And, and I just went like, oh my Lord, when I, when I was like, I think my mouth popped that open at that part. Some of the former members come forth and they talk about EDs and you know what that is because of YouTube, EDs, that's, you know, having disorders and all make in manner of mental illnesses also, simple mental illnesses. Well, it's not really simple, I have it. Anxiety, okay, depression, things like that, you know, that was disobedient. You're, you're not putting God first. You know, Thea Lynn, if you're having anxiety and you're having depression, you're not, you're putting your own feelings and thoughts in front of God. So that's like part of your problem. Is it a chemical imbalance? Is it something like, you know, trauma that needs to be dealt with? No, no, no. This is me riffing. But you, you've been disobedient. So you have people with problems. And so she's taken her weight loss concept and, and moved it into everything. Addictions, mental illness, you name it. She's going to apply the same rigid, unloving, unforgiving behavior and attitude and shaming of people who are in, are in pain and apply that, it's, you know, in her church, in her teachings. And it, to me, it's just horrible because also when people are in that state a state of addiction a state of an eating disorder a state of depression a state of anxiety a state of even a sex addiction they have a lot of shame regarding that and for you to pile shame on top of it it's a wonder that people that people uh, didn't hurt themselves but anyway so th then this is where the campy part you're starting like going dang you know this is dark you know I, I came to watch this as a palate cleanser and now I'm like 
Who does she think she is, right? So anyway, it's a controlling environment and there's allegations, again, that she shunned people for being overweight. Essentially, allegedly like, you know, don't come back until you lose weight. You know, you are not a good fruit. You're not good fruit of the tree. This is me paraphrasing, but this is what the, the people come and tell the documentarian. She acts seemingly as God's intercessor. You don't have the Trinity anymore. You don't have that Holy Ghost. You've got Gwen telling you what's right and what's wrong. And allegedly she took the theory of weight loss and she applied it to everything. Medications. People weren't on their medications. People weren't. It's sad. So let's fast forward. It's 2018. Gwen had been married to her husband, David. She's got two children. One of them, the documentary talks about Michael, struggles. He struggles with his own weight, allegedly, and he also struggles with some, some mental um, problems. Like, uh, that's what the documentary says, so I'm repeating it. And then her daughter, they show her, and she is stick thin, okay? Make it that what you will. Is she dancing with Anna? I don't know. I'm not a doctor. She looks very unwell just by, just by looking at her, all right? She might be healthy as a horse. I don't know. It was a point in time. Maybe she's well. I don't know. But this is a situation in her home. And then in 2018, Gwen Shamblin marries a man called Joe Lara. And here's again where it starts getting campy. And you start, you want to laugh. You're like, you know, this isn't funny, but I want to laugh. Because you know what? When things are crappy, you want to laugh, right? So she meets this guy, Joe Laura. <laughs> and again, it's like a touch of Henry VIII where she's changing the rules of marriage to suit her purposes, to suit her loins. I don't know what her goal was. Maybe she just wanted someone that was going to be a showpiece beside her. You know, but like her husband wasn't. Her husband didn't come to her church anymore. Her husband was fluffy some of the times. Her husband didn't really support her endeavors. And this guy comes along. He's a former actor. Oh, bless his heart. And an old TV movie called Tarzan in Manhattan. And they show him, and he was, you know, aesthetically a good-looking guy. Okay, he had, like, the long hair, long dark hair, and the blue eyes, or green eyes on him. Gorgeous, you know? And his body was all buff, but Tarzan in Manhattan. <laughs> Cheesy! Oh, my God! So he, at this point that he meets up with Gwen, he is aged out of acting, in my opinion. And it's campy. So he was allegedly raised with money, and he's allegedly also, according to his ex, always kind of dated older women in order to maintain his lifestyle, you know? So I, I, I get a little bit of the sugar, sugar baby situation going on here. So, you know, men do it too, by the way. I'm not saying he did. I'm just saying men do it too. And um, so he seemingly was aging out of acting, and he decided he was going to up and go to Nashville and be a big country music star. So he's older now. You know, he was getting older. And he, he up and moves to Nashville and he's going to do country music. And of course, again, I told you the music kind of sucks. And yeah, you, you know how some people just have flat voices and you're like, who told you you could sing? I mean, I, I think it's great that people enjoy singing, but not everyone should do it as like a, as a, as a job. He, seemingly, he's this party boy and he runs across Gwen Shamblin. And what does she have, guys? She's got money, she's got a music studio. Because all this wealth has amassed, you know, huge church on this humongous property. You know, it's, she's got this huge, I think, historic mansion. She's, I think they might have had jets or they ended up getting jets. You get, the, you know what I'm talking about with the lifestyle. What do they call that? The prosperity doctrine. You know what I mean? Like where if you're prosperous, it even means God's blessing you more. And so she, she had wealth, and so he stumbles across her, and she's got a freaking music studio. I think probably because her son Michael liked music. That was probably his one escape, even though, in my opinion, he wasn't, I didn't like his music, but that's just my opinion. Money and a studio, Nashville, Sugar Mama, he's there. He becomes Gwen's sidekick, okay? And he's not hard on the eyes, even though he's older. In my opinion, she makes the decision. Henry VIII, I'm going to get rid of the old one. Here's the new one. And now we're a team, man. Those skirts go up, you know, her her little stacked heels. I mean, I'm talking the kind. I don't think I've even wore, even in my most, like, going out and having a party days ever, wore the kind of stuff she wore. So let me bring in what my cousin told me. 
all right because I called around to some relatives to find out because they live in the area like they lived there I called my cousin and I was like listen you got you I watched this documentary and she hadn't seen it yet and I said I said the name she's like oh I know she goes girl let me I gotta tell you a story and so she proceeds to tell me how her husband worked with someone who was a member of their church and she said this person was perfectly lovely and they get a wedding invitation because she's getting married okay and they're like well we really don't know her that well but okay and it says formal invitation formal like real clear you know don't come dress in casual this is formal so they're like okay but she said i thought it was odd because they really did not know this person turns out she said every single person at where she worked got an invitation bride and groom so if they worked someplace outside of the church everybody got that an invitation now i'm not saying it was facebook like where you had millions of people working for you but yeah could you imagine we're not talking a dozen people in an office everybody at their work whether they knew them or not got an invitation to the wedding okay so my cousin went because the spouse knew her and said they were she was perfectly lovely so they went and she said you know, there was a church i said well did you get married at? and i'm like oh i heard that she that gwen always officiated at these at these weddings and she said yep yeah, she officiated and she said i said was it at ashlawn and she said no there's was like this gorgeous church that was near near and she said it was like so expansive that and there was hundreds and hundreds of cars and she goes and then they had golf carts that took you to the venue like this was fancy pants she says everybody was dressed to the nines like sequins and everything and i said were they dressed all victorian because that's what the documentary said she said i go even the children she said no she goes but everybody was dressed to the nines and on their best behavior she goes and she goes you know what i felt kind of bad because they were so nice everybody came and like would try to kind of introduce you like introduce themselves to you like it was you know sometimes people they leave you alone they say are you bride and groom and then they they, they usher you to a certain side of the the, the the wedding to sit on and and you enjoy the wedding And if you know somebody you wave it's not like a lot of communication but she said there was a lot of different times and that they were so sweet happy joyous she said she felt bad because she felt it was fake, but she didn't want to say anything because she felt guilty. She's like, God, you know, these people are so nice. I feel bad feeling they're kind of fake. And then I guess afterwards, like whenever some of the people from work got together, they were like, that was crazy. That was so crazy because they all felt it was very saccharine and fake, the interactions. And they all, ex they came to, this is before this documentary, that they put their heads together and figured out that the reason in their opinion okay that they all got invited and some of them did not even know these folks was because it was used as a recruiting tool they were being recruited into the church mm -hmm. and they're you know i wouldn't say they're they're you know they, they're well off so if you know you're working at some place and everybody there makes a good amount of money and they don't know anything about your church and they're not stuck into a faith suck them in the thing is is my relatives are catholic that whole group is catholic so they weren't going to have a chance of sucking them in but yeah she said she saw gwen she didn't know anything about gwen she she, she said gwen she said that hair was all teased up and i'm like oh girl it's in the documentary you gotta watch it and she said that the, the skirt she said that she was in her strapless like it was this outfit was strapless and and you know what who cares we're in woke america now you're not allowed to judge anything like that but back in the day officiant the person who is marrying you usually is in a robe and it's rather solemn you're not in a strapless like like dress to walk the boulevard i mean i can't like i can't but yeah she told me a lot of goss she really did but she said that they were very sweet saccharine sweet she brought up the Tammy Faye of her own accord. I said, yep, I've already done my script. And that's in there. She brought up the uh, Stepford Wives element of it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. But she, yep, that's the exact same feeling she got from it. So they were very nice though. It just, she didn't get recruited because they're Catholic. They had no <laughs> no interest. It, it's a crazy tale. Make, make no mistake. Then the documentary, because mind you, when the documentary is allegedly being filmed and edited by HBO and there's three episodes they didn't know what's going to happen to this church to this group 
and some fatality happens. We'll get into it. Something fatal happens. When HBO is interviewing people, sometimes they don't know that they're soon to be free if they're looking to get free of the church because Gwen is going to die in a plane crash along with her husband and along with some of the other leaders. But before then, Joe, he's married, newly married to Gwen, and he has an ex, I think it was an ex-partner, I don't know if she was an ex-wife, we'll just call her an ex. So Joe has a history, he has an ex, and they have a daughter together. And once he marries Gwen, he now had the legal backing from Gwen to fight his ex for custody of the daughter. And the ex was like, no, I'm not playing, okay? She wasn't playing around and she seemed like a tough cookie. And at one point, the ex was accused by Joe in 2019. So that tells you this is an accusal after he's already with Glenn and has some support. He accuses his wife of essay of their very young daughter out of nowhere. And this is later categorically denied in the documentary. It was put forth as being something just to keep her from getting custody. So there really is no true essay, seemingly according to both sides, but it was floated as a reason to keep her from getting the custody. So, of course, she then fought harder because she was mad. So a part of the documentary is dedicated to to this custody fight between Joe and his ex over the child and... The ex says it, Natasha, believed, she said she believed that the child could become brainwashed by the church. And that was one reason why she was fighting so hard to maintain sole custody in order to have custody of, of the child. And at this point in the documentary, all the parties were still alive. Gwen seemingly had the money and the lifestyle and the vacations to keep Joe Laura happy, to keep him around. He was a former actor and he they were putting on a show. You know, they, as this couple were putting on a show. So I don't know if they ever talked about who would be second in command. When you have a church with a C word, it's almost like, uh, you know what? And you have someone that's all knowing, almost the intercessor to God, or even if there is God anymore, since you've blown the Trinity up, you got to talk about who's going to take over if something happens. And It wasn't going to be David, her husband, her previous husband, because he didn't fit the mold. And then she gets Joe Laura in, but it's still a fresh marriage, right? But she has two children. She has Michael, who seemingly doesn't really want it, and then she has Elizabeth, all right, her daughter. And then they get into the fact that, sadly, this this is a shame, Elizabeth has a son. So Gwen has a grandson, and I believe it's a grandson, and the son ends up dying of SIDS. Which happens? Sudden infant death syndrome. The members talk about how when Elizabeth's son died, that it was like hush-hush in the church. They didn't mourn him. They didn't grieve him. She wasn't allowed the the normal time to recover, seemingly. And that the members, in their opinion, that affected her, but that she had to smash it down. And you'd see, objectively, just by looking, that Elizabeth did not look well. She could be well, but she did not look well. She looked like she was struggling, like she's stick thin, stick thin. Like you can see the outline of her skull, okay? So I have, my sympathy is with Elizabeth. It really is, and with Michael. I mean, it's got to be hard with a charismatic leader as your parent. And so the thought was always that Elizabeth, the golden child, would be the one to take over the church if anything was to happen. And then when she lost the baby to SIDS, it was a thought of why is God bringing this upon us? We've not done anything wrong in our, in our nuclear family of Gwen, Joe, Laura, you know, whatever, Elizabeth and Michael. Couldn't be us. So it has to be something that the church as a member has brought on. So allegedly they all brought all these people in to try to figure out why God brought this SIDS down upon them and then look to blame, to place blame on people. Like, what have you done wrong that God is now punishing us? That is so manipulative. That is so bad. I can't even think about how these people fear judgment for the baby's passing and that they feared it would be placed upon them for something they had done. 
I can't even fathom what some of these folks were, were operating under, especially after there was shown that some members got the legal team supporting the one that would stay. You have a husband and a wife, one of them leaves, whoever's got the kids especially, the legal team is going to fight against you leaving. They're going to try to make it so you don't get custody, you don't see your kids anymore, they're going to, I mean that's tough and that sometimes makes you stay. It makes you stay against your, your better judgment. It's, it's a duress of sorts, in my opinion. So some of the members speak out in this documentary and they're talking about all the times they, they knocked up against this legal department or the, the lawyers being paid for by the church or by Gwen, I'm not sure. And that if they got divorced, the member who left the church might end up with the spouse funded by their legal team. And the insinuation being that the chi children of the couple would then remain with the remnants of the church. So that was always important. And a, a younger member talks about how the children were very important to them. So they always wanted to keep the children within the, the bosom of the 144,000. So over time, the church becomes all-inclusive. And what I mean by this is not that you're going on a sandals vacation and they're giving you alcohol and uh, massages and all the food you can eat. That's not what I mean by all-inclusive here. It's a kind of a compound, allegedly, with many services offered, offered like, and this can make you a captive audience where you're in a group and you have venues for the events. Remember I just talked about how she's gonna officiate your wedding and there's already a whole entire venue and all the different people that come all right, the members come to your wedding, whether you know them or not, and they're all bringing their gifts to the wedding. You know, whatever they're good at, they're covering it. So everybody's equally covering these huge weddings because it's, it's a recruiting tool, in my opinion. Then they have real estate connections. They had ele electrical connections for things that went wrong in the house. They had, I think it was car dealerships or car repair shops. They had doctors, they had estheticians, they had, I don't want to call it celebration because we have that in Florida where we have certain communities that aren't religious, but they, they have everything in them. So you don't, almost like you don't have to leave. It's a captive audience, unless you want to. I mean, you're not forced to, but it's like if the grocery store, everything you need is right there. You really have no reason to leave. And that is kind of what some of the people said was being created. People could argue that this was a high controlled group and they have argued that this is a high control group and this is a part of a C. Alt, if you know what I'm talking about. High control groups, they control everything you're doing. Who you're talking to, who you're allowed to talk to, where you're allowed to go. You know, if you have social media, you gave your passwords to leadership so they could monitor what you're doing on social media. And this is what some of the members have come forth and said that that was their experience. Members turning each other in for infractions. Mm -hmm. Husbands turning in their wives for not being submissive. That's what's being told. Believe it, don't believe it, I don't know. As the documentary continues, Gwen's appearance changes even more. Again, like I said, she started off looking like a normal uh, middle-aged like cat newscaster and her hair and outfits go up, the skirts go up, the, 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 the stacked heels go up, and her ego goes up. And it's, it's campy, that part of it's campy, there's no denying. And one anonymous member is filmed. Her name is Sarah, and she's in shadow. She talks about how she, oh, this is so hard to wrap your mind around the fact that someone felt the need to do this in order to get out of the group. She, her husband was supported by their attorneys, and so she was kind of forced to stay in. So what she did in order to get out was she seduced Gwen's son in order to have leverage to break away from the church. That's crazy. I mean, you got to want out bad in order to know that you're also harming somebody else to do that. And she said she had an eating disorder. Ed was on the, on the team here and that she'd tried to break away. She came up against a fight for full custody of her children. And she recounts how then she decided to meet with Michael. This is what she said. And that they would drink Jack Daniels and carry on liaisons. 
and Sarah tells us how Michael confided in her about all his sorrows, which makes me feel sorry for Michael, that he was in an unhappy marriage. That's what she said. And that he was so angry at the church that something about, something about like shooting up the church, sometimes he'd get these thoughts. <laughs> wow. So she tries to leave. She finally, you know, gets enough evidence and she tries to leave. And when she gets resistant, she says this, stop with a legal fight or everything will come out. She, she had stuff with her and Michael and she was just going to flap it out there. And that, so, you know what? <laughs> oh God, she gets her way. She gets out. She's free. She's anonymous and in shadow, but she got out and she got free. So I guess that worked. And, but she also recounts and shows photos of her own child his legs or her legs that had been beaten multiple times because they allegedly wiggled while they were having their diaper changed. And it is abuse. What the pictures she showed were abuse. And then the documentary turns really dark because it delves not only into what we talked about, the strict dieting and the, you know, controlling your medications and controlling your addictions and stuff also goes into disciplining the members' children. And in 2004, members Joseph and Sonia Smith, so Joseph Smith is the name, it's not the Mormon dude at all, it's just two members of the Remnants Church, they were convicted of murdering their son Joseph, so you had jo Joseph Sr. and Joseph Jr. in Cobb County, Georgia. So they had they had a, I don't know if you call it like an offshoot or a, um, an outpost or another part of their church in, in Georgia. And there's plenty of footage of the Smiths with Gwen. So they knew each other. And also, like I said, they were videoing and you had audio tapes of everything. So state seemingly did not go against the church for the members' actions. But they went to get some members and the members um, ended up getting life sentences for killing their child, for murdering their child. The other members in this documentary tell of the church giving tips on corporal punishment, all right? So they mentioned hitting with hot glue sticks. You know those little glue sticks that you use when you use a glue gun? Who would have thunk that? I would never have you know, heard of that, but that's a new one. Belts, wooden spoons, and allegedly, Sonia Smith, the member, asked for help with her son and was told to use a glue stick, like a hot glue stick, for disciplinary um, measures. That's allegedly what's in here. And a story was recounted by a babysitter that the story went on, went down in Easter of 2003, so that would have been before 2004. And she talks about how she was um, doing a babysitting service, like where you watch a bunch of the kids while the, the parents go in to um to have their meeting or their service and that joseph smith jr was crying and upset and she asked the father hey is there anything i can give him to maybe like calm him down you know to keep him happy like while y'all are in your service and that her at that the seat the dad went yeah and she went excuse no sir i don't feel comfortable disciplining your child i'm certainly not gonna hit him is there anything and he was like no and so since she refused to discipline the child in that manner, allegedly he went off into a room and did so. And she made a mental note of that. And then later on, when it hits the news that they were accused of murdering their child, she came forward and they pulled also audio from this. And there's audio of Gwen seemingly, I would say, having conversations with them about disciplining their child. And it wasn't timing out, okay? So they're found guilty of abusing their child and putting him in a wicker box so that they could attend services. And apparently he popped his little head out of this box and someone, one of them slammed it down and I think it cracked his skull. But the coroner in Cobb County, Georgia, it's the worst case of CA they had ever seen and the only unmarked, undamaged, unbrutalized part of that child's body was the palm of his hands and the bottom of his feet. So the couple was sentenced to life plus 30 years for all their crimes against their son. And strangely enough, you might say, well, you know what, Theolyn, you have, you have a church with 2,000 members. You can't blame one couple's actions on the church. You, you, you can't make that correlation. Well, 
not only was and, and the and the and the police did not and the state seemingly did not have enough evidence to charge the church as well. They charged the parents, the ones that laid hands. But seemingly there is some audio proof of how they gave suggestions on corporal punishment. And then the church rallied behind the couple during their trial, paying their legal fees allegedly. And Gwen is on some deposition saying that the child ran into a banister. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't CA. The child ran into a banister. There's, there's recordings of Gwen stating, quote, if you don't spank your child, the world will spank your child. It, you know, it's, it's pretty clear that she supported corporal punishment. And you just got to keep in mind that in a rigid con high, high control group that people are wanting to please and they want to make sure their kids aren't acting up in church. And, and when the kids are acting up in church, it's gonna, you know, they're going to be shamed, and so maybe they take it too far. So the documentary is being filmed. The witnesses are being interviewed. The court cases with Joe Laura and his ex-wife about their daughter are still continuing in 2019. And this is going along, and then there's a plane crash. Mm -hmm. May 29th of 2021, a 68, 66 B-8 Cessna private jet, that's a small jet, carrying Gwen, her husband Joe, her son-in-law, so that, that's her daughter's husband, and four other church members departs from Smyrna, Georgia on the way to Palm Beach International Airport. And what they didn't bring up in the documentary, and I'm not sure why, is they were on their way to a Trump rally. And they didn't get into this yet, and maybe they're still going to get into it because we're only three episodes in. They allegedly were became really extreme Trumpers and they allegedly being a, a control group in my opinion they were putting pressure on the members to also support that political persuasion and allegedly before politics wasn't a part of the church but then I guess with the the election <laughs> they wanted to then also make sure the followers uh, fell in line and that was causing some trouble but they were on the way to a Trump rally and what happens the plane crashes in the water at percy priest lake in nashville so it wasn't um that far after or shortly after takeoff and killing everybody on board so it kills gwen kills her husband kills the daughter's husband i think michael and the daughter are still alive and then four of the other main leaders gwen is 66 years old at this point and it was always thought that the golden child Elizabeth would take the reins. We don't know if that's what's going to happen. Allegedly, no one on the plane was legally qualified to fly the aircraft on that date. So, and this is where the documentary leaves you. And I think the reason why is this. They weren't expecting them to die in a plane crash. And you have two years from the date of the crash in most states. So I'm not sure about Georgia. So they took off, they landed, so they took off in Tennessee and they landed in Georgia. So it'd probably be either Tennessee or Georgia. You usually are going to have two years from the date of that crash to sue. And so it's going to come down to who, who owned the plane and who was flying the plane. And if, and if it wasn't the person that was flying, if you had another pilot there. So I don't think anybody in that plane at that date was was you know lawfully flying that plane and then whoever owns the plane also could have could have some liability now you think who would sue them well if they landed on a piece of property and did cause damage they could get sued they could get sued by some of the family members of the other folks they could sue them like hey you took me out on a plane you took my family member up on a plane i have standing you know, I'm the daughter of one of the members or the husband of one of the members or whatever. I have standing to sue because you led my relative to believe it was a safe flight, that, that it was all on board, and maybe the plane was overweight. Maybe the pilot was not licensed. Maybe this, that, or the, the other. So I think there could be a possible lawsuit, and I think that's also why HBO might be keeping it on the back burner you know, for more episodes, because it says to be continued. So, after her mother's death, heir apparent, Elizabeth Shamblin Hannah, her last name's Hannah, she married Hannah. Mr. Hannah is also um, 
he died in the crash. So I don't know if she's going to be taking over leadership of the church. Was the jet, jet overweight? That's one question. Like, I believe it was a mix. I think they're thinking this is just speculation. All right. I think they speculate that it was a mix of plot pilot error and bad weather. And maybe he couldn't see like which way was up with the clouds and all that stuff. What if the plane was overweight? Could you imagine the karma of that? That you have folks that feel in your church and through the years have felt that you've shamed them for being physically overweight and you get on a plane that's overweight. Karma is, you know, if you believe in the concept of karma, it's, she's, she's, she's a relentless, ruthless bee. So if that's the case, oh Lord. But yeah, that's where we're left off on this. We don't know who's going to take over. We don't know if they're going to take over. We don't know if some of these people who felt controlled and felt scared to leave, if now they won't, because Elizabeth doesn't seem to be as um, much of a force as her mother. So also there's some thought that maybe they're just wrapping everything up to, in order to like finalize the estate and just liquidate. So who knows? Who knows? But I, I think, you know, I always try to do a takeaway and I think, what's the takeaway? Well, trust your gut. First, I mean, takeaways always trust your gut. If something starts feeling wrong, have know your worth and know that you can leave. Know that you can say, you know, this isn't for me and leave. Don't, don't um, stay where you're uncomfortable and where something's not serving you. And don't, don't try to let people shame you for things. Don't let people shame you for. Be, ha, being depressed or for for being overweight or for anything and you know just don't let anyone take your agency away from you i don't know i'm kind of really jabbered on and i if you've watched this please come to the water cooler and get in the comment section and tell me what you thought i hope you enjoyed this i hope um that you're surviving and that you're even thriving if that's possible during this time and if you wouldn't mind, please hit that like button and hit the subscribe bell if you haven't. And if you have, just make sure you're still subscribed because sometimes YouTube does weird things and unsubscribes people. <laughs> and um, I hope you're doing well and I hope you guys have an excellent Halloween. And I hope to put some videos out there in the more spooky realm. So without further ado, have an excellent day. Bye.